Thad Brown along with A.J. Feldman. I am in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. J, or A.J. is back at the home office on Humboldt Street in Rochester talking about this uh, Stefan Diggs trade. A.J., let me start with this. This is almost a Carl Jones eye bug out kind of move. So give me the story of how you found out today that Stefan Diggs had been traded to the Houston Texans. Uh, I actually just got a text from one of my friends who's also a big uh, Bills fan. And I'll pull it up directly uh, because it was vague enough where I had to do some investigating. It was <laughs> uh, not good in all caps. Uh, so I'm like, all right, let's figure out what this is. Go on Twitter. And then at this, you know, it was in the morning. Obviously, we work late. I'm half conscious at that point. So I started seeing it on Twitter. I'm like, all right, I see it on Twitter. Let's double check who's tweeting it. Make sure it's not Adam Schefter or whoever. So then, uh, you know, then I saw it and, and then I was officially up for the day. Wide awake. So my story is similar. I also got a text from a friend that was vague. His text was holy S word. <laughs> now I'm on vacation here in Myrtle Beach and I'm trying to be on vacation. I'm still following what's going on in the NFL talking bills or whatever. But the moment that, text came in on a thread that's normally a bills related thread my heart sank because i knew vacation was not going to be vacation at least for today so i immediately did the same thing you did went to twitter saw the report confirmed it wasn't adam Schefter because that dude is everywhere in early april and then you know saw saw what the news was and let me shift to this aj one to ten give me your surprise meter with 10 being the most surprising thing ever? Honestly, like a three. Really? Yeah, I, I wasn't too taken aback by it. You know, I mean, not that there was writing on Like, it, it didn't make sense from a cast pr perspective, which is why everybody was kind of brushing this aside. You know, you know, you, know, you could talk about the tweets and the weird texts, you know, and, and the things he says in his, you know, press conferences and interviews and things like that. But it's just the cat. If it wasn't a cap, this would be like a one. But the the cap brings up a little bit. I honestly wasn't too surprised. You know, I it it feels like a kind of a relationship that kind of ran its course at this point. And I think all the things you're saying there make sense. I will still say this was an eight for me. And the only reason it wasn't a ten is because the other move the Bills have made this year kind of lead towards clearing the decks, moving on, getting things ready for the future. And yeah, I mean, the, the tweets and the stuff, and, and you're not wrong. I mean, it definitely felt like the relationship has run its course, but it kind of felt like that last year in, in May and June when Stephon Diggs wasn't reporting, and they went through a whole season with him then. And, you know, the, the going forward with this team, we all knew there would be likely a receiver drafted early. And my thought, I've talked to Carl Jones about this a couple of times, is that with Diggs in town, that rookie doesn't have to be your number one guy right away. He can learn. He can be whatever he wants. He can be two, three, contributor. Now, whoever that guy is, he's going to have to be the guy if they don't trade for someone else who can be the guy. And, and if that doesn't happen, then you're looking at Dalton Kincaid to take the giant leap to be the guy. So for all of those factors, I was surprised. I guess looking back, though, there is a whole lot of logic to it. Let's talk about that. You know, the the salary cap issue is one thing in that, the Bills are going to eat 20 or 31 million in dead money this year. And they're going to take on about three and a half more in salary cap obligations this year for a team that's been, you know, barely under the cap to begin with. But, you know, this is a team that clearly from the Mitch Morris and the Jordan Poyer and the Stu Davis white moves, they're looking towards the future. And Stefan Diggs at soon to be 31 is a guy who would be, like you said, if you take the salary cap aside, certainly someone who would be a candidate to be a part of that youth excavation of getting guys out of here and getting ready for a brand new Bills core in 24 and beyond. Yeah, because the thing with this offseason and, and basically to the same extent last season, the Bills had no real tangible like way to build forward other than draft picks and you know gradual improvement from the guys already on the roster. That's kind of all they had to do. They had the draft picks. They could do minor things. They could re-sign Daquan Jones, you know, AJ Epinesa, bring in Curtis Samuel, things like that. But there was never a, a real way for them to increase, you know, you know, make a big splash. They made their splash with Von Miller. So they really didn't have any cards to play other than just gradually getting better. 
So it's kind of going to be the same thing this year. They're going to try and get themselves into the playoffs, scratch their way. They're going to have Josh Allen as their quarterback. They're going to hope that he can go on some crazy run, which is kind of sort of a little bit what the plan has been the last couple of years, you know, especially last year, get there. And at that point, you're just flipping coins. Now they can kind of still do that this year, of course. And then next year, okay, now we're going to have more draft picks. Now we're going to have more draft capital. The cap's going to keep on going up. Now we can actually do things instead of just always being a step behind the Chiefs and other teams in the AFC. Now we can finally try and make another leap like we did with Von Miller to get above these teams rather than just, you know, flip coins in the playoffs. And and do what they've done the last two years, which has been we're going to void years, we're going to – restructure guys we're going to play all the salary cap games pull out all the salary cap shenanigans to keep ourselves functional with the team we have as opposed to going out adding real impact guys more than one at least in free agency and now you look 2025 and right about now they have about 255 million in salary cap obligations no one has a real projection on the cap next year but with it at 254 this year i think 280 is a reasonable number to start with so the Bills are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 million under the cap right now as we stand. And, yeah, they'll add some money with the guys they draft, and they might sign a player or two. But they're most likely going to go into 25 with money to spend at the beginning. And then you can, you know, you can cut some other guys. You can still do all that restructure stuff. But now you're going to have $30, 40 50 million. So this – and this has been the theme of the whole offseason, which is short-term loss, take a step back this year, to move forward in the future. And you look at where the Bills are now, and yeah, they lost a couple picks in this digs trade. The the net number of picks was a negative, but they still have, what, 10 picks this year. They're going to have a full load, almost a full load of picks next year. Regardless, you got all those guys you're going to draft this year that you can build. If you want to trade up, you can improve your set, whatever. And then you're going to go into next year with salary cap space. This team is set up to be really, really big-time competitive 25 26 and beyond and and that's after doing what brandon bean had to do this offseason after all the salary cap messing around which was clean things up this was going to be a reset year a transition year you know this is the theme of what bills fans i told us said this before in one of our previous discussions transition year is the phrase of the year for bills fans because this team is not built for this year but after this year they're going to be awesome now i give brandon bean credit today because he laid it out you know, I know he did the whole thing about be patient. We're going to have a good team in the field. And I'm sure they're going to make every effort to do that. But he said, look, are we a better team now after this move? No, he was honest about it. And he's right. They're not better. So for this year, this is probably not a playoff team. But I think it's the right move to take that step back this year. Especially when you look at the receiver position. A, it's better to get rid of your guy one year too early or whatever than too late. They did have that was Stefan Diggs. And B, there's kind of two main main ways to acquire top tier talent the receiver position these days. A, it's get a guy in the draft, which they can certainly do. And B, you've got so many guys who trade teams, you know, veterans who can't get a new contract. There's trades, you know, things of that nature. So to put yourself in a position next year or the year after that to get a guy, you know, like kind of the the Texans did, like Stephon Diggs, a good guy with a big contract. Okay, we can we can make this work for two years and try and get ourselves over the top. You know, Keenan Allen, you know, older wide receivers, more veteran wide receivers who are still productive. But, you know, if you can make that work for one or two years, you can certainly – you know, make that a compliment to Khalil Shakir, you know, Dalton Kincaid, whoever they bring in in the first round. And now now you're really working with a, a good skill unit. Or they could just go the wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver route in the draft and, and you know, press their luck with all three of those guys. So now they have options at the receiver position other than being locked into digs for this year. Well, they're locked in this year, but next year after that. Because for all the, the cap that they, you know, eat this year, it's clear for next season. And to your point, you know, you kind of joked about eight, drafting eight receivers, but options is where the Bills are at because, yes, they're almost certainly going to draft a receiver high this year, and that guy probably becomes the guy they hope takes over for digs at wide receiver one. But worst case scenario, you draft a guy and he's Jalen Rager. No chance ever to be good. Well, you know what? You got the cap room next year. You can go trade for the Keenan Allen, or maybe T. Higgins is available. You go sign him. All of those options will be on the table to solve 
that wide receiver one needs sometime between now and September 2025 when the Bills will probably be more likely to be a legit elite Super Bowl contender. Now, the Bills made this trade with a team in their conference, which is a little bit curious. What was your take on sending Diggs to Houston? Now, look, Diggs might not be the same guy he was two, three years ago, but you know what? Neither of the Texans. How smart a move was that for the Brent, for the Bills? I think it says a couple of things. I think it says, A, this was probably clearly the best offer that they had because if, if you're trying to break a tie, not trading them to an AFC rival that has C.J. Stroud and all these players on the rise is a good way to break that tie. And B, I think it finally it, it says that the Bills were definitely concerned about the drop-off in his production. They probably think he only has one or two years left of elite-level play. If you talk about this transition year, okay, Stephon Diggs is probably going to be good next year. But you know what, where the Bills were kind of taking next year off, sort of, kind of, we're going to see what happens. So maybe there's one year of overlap where Stephon Diggs is really good on the Texans and the Bills are really good trying to go to the Super Bowl. Maybe you have one year of overlap in 2025, it would be. But after that, I don't think the Bills are too worried about, you know, Diggs and Stroud being a great connection for the next five years and, you know, terrorizing the AFC here. Especially when the Texans have young receivers already, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, to where if you're Houston, you probably want to clear Diggs out of the way after next year anyway to let those young guys blossom. So it's a great point that Diggs and Houston as a threat in 2025 is pretty unlikely. What is likely, I think, is that this trade probably had more to do than just football. You can talk about where Diggs is at in the, as a player. And I'll tell you what, I think last year there was a decline. I think it was slight. I think you're right. He's still going to be a pretty good player this year. Not the elite guy anymore, but a pretty good player still. It wouldn't stun me, though, if he fell off the table. However, I still think he's pretty good. So you don't want that guy, A, off your team, especially when you're going to pay for him anyway, and B, on arrival. To me, when you eat $31 million in dead cap space, there has to be other non-football reasons involved. We kind of touched on it a little bit. The off-the-field stuff, kind of the passive-aggressive, you know, I'm going to tweet something, but then I'm going to have a press conference and act like I've been offended because why would you ever suggest that there's any way that I would ever cause a problem and then I'm going to tweet something else in March and I'm not going to show up for camp. You know, I don't know if there's anything overt and Stefan Diggs posted on Instagram a nice thank you, Buffalo. You know, for the most part, he did a lot of the right things, but it seemed like there were the, the small things that may have built up over the course of time that made it a little easier for the Bills to part ways. Like I said, bottom line, you don't make this trade without there being some other off the field reason or behind the scene reason that helped make the motivation easier for you to create this divorce. Yeah. And you know, obviously there was no massive one thing that, that led to this in terms of this relationship breaking down, but man, it's like, you know, two or three years of, you know, comments and tweets and interviews and, you know, looks and things on the sidelines, like, Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott, Josh Allen to maybe an extent. I'm sure it just kind of wears on them. Like, all right, we, we keep got to keep dealing with, you know, it's it's like they always say in the NFL, if you're, you know, an elite level talent, you, you get to put up with a lot of stuff. You get to fall asleep in teams meetings. You can, you can do all that stuff. When you're, you know, low end wide receiver one, whatever, it becomes easier to, to part ways. And, and, you know, obviously, you know, Brandon Bean said that he didn't like, you know right before the draft the trade happened he didn't like text Allen hey we're making this trade it's happening now but he was in the loop and you know it's not like Allen is the GM of the Bills but he gets guys his friends on the team you know if, if you know practice squad wide receivers backup quarterback so so he has a little bit of influence on the roster if Josh Allen you know got this call from Brandon Bean, flew out to Orchard Park, marched into his office and said, there is 0% chance I'm, you know, playing without Stefan Diggs. I think things might've gone a little bit differently. So I'm not saying that like Allen, you know, requested to get Diggs out of here by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think Allen was, you know, pounded on the table to make sure that the Stefan Diggs stayed around in Buffalo. I think you're right. I will point out that not, maybe not pounded on the table, but certainly, Josh Allen's first hire in Buffalo, Ken Dorsey, didn't work out great. So I can see that conversation, the pound on the table conversation in Brandon Bean's office where Josh Allen says, I'm leaving if Devon, 
you know, like it's like Hoosiers. If coach goes, I go. If Stevon Diggs goes, I, I go. If that happens, Brandon B might have come back with, well, Ken Dorsey didn't work out great, buddy. So why am I listening to you now? But the whole different discussion didn't matter. I think you're right. You know, Allen was at some level on board with this to make it okay. Now, look, we, we've talked about the fact that this is part of an entire offseason that feels more of a for 2025 than 2024, even though Brandon Bean was adamant that he's going to put a legit top flight competitive team on the field. And he might, you know, if they happen to run into Justin Jefferson 2.0 in the draft, well, then it changes the whole outlook for 2024. But what now do the Bills do in the draft, AJ? Do they sit at 28 and maybe hope a receiver falls or even take something else at 28 and hope somebody falls to them at pick 60? Or would you be on board or prefer a trade up to as high as they need to go to get whatever guy you think they have to get? I think a, I think they have to have their first pick be receiver, not, you know, any breaking news there, but I think the the mindset here should be kind of no half measures. You know, if you're going to make a trade up, go all the way up for one of those top three guys, go into the top 10, go into the top 12. If, if one of them's falls, I think that's a move worth making a, you know, a Julio Jones type trade. What I don't want to see them do is give away more draft capital, draft capital, move up from 28 to, you know, 23, do one of those Brandon Bean trades where he has one final guy with a a first round grade and he goes up and gets somebody because there's so many guys in this receiver draft. We don't know that the fifth best receiver is going to be so much better than the sixth or the seventh best receiver. So if you're going to go up, go up, but, but I don't want to mess around with, you know, giving up assets to maybe have a better shot on hitting my receiver. Yeah. If I'm Brandon Bean, I'm calling everybody from pick five on down and and seeing what the price is. And then now a couple caveats to that. Number one, no team in NFL history has ever traded from outside the top 20 to pick five or above only using draft picks. So I pick five is probably off the table. It won't matter anyway. I think the first five picks are going to be four quarterbacks and Marvin Harrison Jr. in some order. The Bills aren't getting any of those guys or getting any of those picks. But after that, six, seven, eight, nine, not 10, because it's the Jets and the Patriots are in there somewhere too. I forget what number they're at. There are still opportunities in there for the Bills to make a trade. And the Bears at nine are the place I would, you know, look at first because the Bears have the first overall pick and they have a lot of holes to fill. They would probably rather have a bunch of guys than one guy at nine. Even so, the way this draft is set up, it's really not only good at the top but deep at the top and teams even the bears might have a hard time dropping out of that top 10 to 12 where you've got all the elite guys down to 28 where you probably have second round rated players so if the bills are going to go up to your point a full measure might be the only way they get up there they might have to overpay but i'm with you if you identify a guy that you think is the guy to be a number one receiver then go get him and and almost I don't care what the cost is. Let's not go Mike Dicka and Ricky Williams and trade the whole draft, but whatever you got to pay to first round or this year, first round, first round or next year's in play, second round next year's in play, both the twos, I'm fine with whatever. Go up and get your guy. And your guy doesn't have to be Odunze or neighbors. If it's Brian Thomas Jr., that's fine. That probably don't cost you as much. Either way, go get your guy because they can't miss, at least for 2024, on this receiver pick. If you don't have that top flight receiver who can take over for digs, then what we expect to happen will be the outcome. And this will be a season of hoping and praying and that Patrick Mahomes and Joe Burrow all get hurt for some reason. And you can roll through the playoffs on some miracle uh, list of bounces. Like we said, now, if you miss the receiver long-term, you can probably trade for a guy in 25. But the thing the Bills need to do, the number one priority in this draft is to find that replacement for Stephon Diggs. So I'm with you pay whatever you got to pay and, right, and the, so, and the oh, go ahead and the thing with potentially trading you know next year's first round pick if, if all this works out that could be a very low draft pick and that second round pick from the vikings that could be as high as the number one pick so that could end up being number 33 who knows what the vikings are going to do a quarterback who knows what their team is going to be like next year justin jefferson you know a rookie quarterback who knows so that second round pick could almost essentially be like a first rounder next year. So if you have to give up a first round pick, it might not be the end of the world there. Right. And, and, you know, you could use those two twos, even if it's not the first one overall, 
theoretically to package yourself back into the first round if you needed to. Again, the Bills have set themselves up very nicely for options 2025 and beyond. For 2024, what are they now? They, they might be the fifth best team in the AFC. You know, Chiefs, Bengals, Ravens, Texans in some order ahead of them. Chiefs first, obviously. I think Bills fans just need to get comfortable with the idea that this year may not work out unless you get a bunch of things to bounce your way, including having a home run in the draft. But 25, that's where the Bills might be cooking. And that's what Brandon Bean has done with what he's done in these moves this offseason. Yeah, and for and for all of this thing about, you know, listing the teams above them, none of those teams are in the AFC East. They're still the favorite to win their division. So if you can win your division, you know, Miami's coming up, but they've had their number in the past. You win your division, you get a home game in the playoffs. Now you just got to win two more to get to the Super Bowl. So you get into the dance, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I actually think that the biggest threat to the Bills in the division this year is the Jets staying healthy. I mean, they won't because they're old and, you know, 41-year-old quarterback and all that stuff. And but the if Jets. they somehow did – exactly. Yeah. But if they did somehow stay healthy, I, I like the Jets' full-strength team. I might like them better than the Bills' team as we sit here right now. The Bills are obviously going to add a, a big receiver in the draft. That will change things. But, um, but to, to underline your point, if the Jets staying healthy and not being the Jets is your biggest threat, you're probably in good shape. All right. As always, you can check these discussions out at rosterfirst.com. You click on rosterfirst.com, look under the sports tab, eight sports extra. We have discussions on bills, off season news, all season long, YouTube as well. AJ, Carl, and I were on periodically whenever the bills do something big. And this definitely qualifies to discuss it for your enjoyment. AJ, thanks for joining me. I'm going to go back to my vacation now. There's a margarita with my name on it somewhere over there. Thanks for hanging out with me, and thanks to you at home for watching and listening.